Now, Powell, uh, I think we need to see the Powell who we saw a few years ago at Jackson Hole. Succinct, to the point, um, financial conditions have eased to such a great extent, um, even since the Fed went into blackout. Uh, so I, I really do think that he needs to be resolute and emphasize that they're still data dependent and uh, communicate that the market's gotten way ahead of itself. Okay, so let's go there. You think the market's gotten way competitive, uh, way ahead of itself. Ten-year Treasury was 5%, as Tom Keene would say, just a cup of coffee ago. Now we're at 4.16%. Yes, we are. What happened? Well, look, this is the Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank's Jim Reed does a great job of tracking head pivot rallies. Okay. We're in number seven right now, seven since the Fed started to raise rates in June of 2022. So the markets are constantly pushing Powell to, to acquiesce, to break, but yet nothing's broken yet. When he broke in late 2018, it was because bond issuance froze solid for 41 days. He had to break because the market was saying systemic risk. There's no systemic risk with stocks near all-time highs at all. And that's why he's going to push back. And that's why he's going to say, until we get to, he's going to repeat. His very first interview after he got reconfirmed by the Senate, he gave to NPR, he used 2% target 14 times in a rather <laughs> short interview. And he hasn't changed his tune since then. And that's what I think frustrates so many investors is that they want for him to be somebody who he's refused to be since he was reconfirmed. And Danielle, we, we look at some of the commentary we've been hearing from Powell. What can he actually say to maybe push back? Because we look at individual words being changed and words being removed from what he's saying. Mm -hmm. And that's driving the markets right now price in north of four cuts next year. Sure. What, what does he do? Well, I, I think he um, I think he points to his precious Supercore, which Haver Analytics has actually added to their platform. <laughs> he he says my Supercore is still too hot, so I'm not convinced that CPI, X Energy is excuse me X Energy X Shelter I can't even remember the definition right now, is slowing to a sufficient degree for me to be convinced that we're going to hit two percent. If he starts to bring up some of these some of the things that he's by the way c conjured out of thin air. <laughs> Um, then I think that markets will start to get the point. How about the labor market here? Mm. Boy, that was a lot stronger than a lot of people thought. And what he's going to, boy, he's going to reference yes, that he all is. day long and on Sundays. So I know you peeled the onion back a thousand layers. When you looked at the, the, the labor data, what, what did you really see? Well, what I saw was I tried to look at the labor market in 2023. And what I saw was 1.32 million jobs had been imputed by the birth death model. 52% of job creation in 2023 is an imputation by statisticians. Imputation. It's based on births going wild when we've got bankruptcies running at the fastest pace since 2010. So square that circle. Yep. And by the way, the BLS, since they introduced this in 2001, has been incorrect at every inflection point in the economy and they've packed too many births in there that they then had that then had to revise out in prior years and revisions are up to negative 372,000 in terms of what's been reported government job creations gone through the roof All right, the so private sector is not I want to just quote from your notes uh, it's safe to say that no federal statistical agency has made the appearance of being so corrupted or inept in US history who are we referring to and and, and what are we referring to well, we're, we're referring to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's one or the other. My gosh, the not statistically adjusted inflation numbers yesterday were insane. They were a complete departure from what statistically adjusted was reported for the Consumer Price Index. You're like, you could drive a Mack truck through it, choose. And we live in a big data world. There's no excuse to me. It's not, you can do more with fewer people and a great big microchip, period. Okay. How about the dot plot today? We have a function oh, on the terminal, yeah. DOTS. Yeah. I'm going to load that baby up. What's that going to tell me today? So what was taken away in September, I think they give, I think they possibly give back one of the two rate cuts that they took away and say, we might get three next year. I think they're going to thread that needle. So they probably won't stick with just two rate cuts in 2024, and that will be the focus, by the way. Uh, but we will also continue to see that the end, end, end game still ends with a Fed funds rate with a two handle. And I think you have to keep bearing in mind, this is Powell's legacy. He wants to jettison QE. He wants right. to jettison 0% zero bound interest rate policy. He wants for them to be gone when he leaves. And I think that he's also going to 
potentially reallude to uh, the Logan uh, plan, which is to potentially cut rates and continue quantitative tightening. What did we see this morning in the MBA weekly application data? 19.4% increase in refinancings. That means that the Fed's going to be able to start playing catch up with the mortgage-backed securities quantitative tightening it has not been able to accomplish since June of 2022. I'll piggyback off of Paul, kind of looking at your notes. When you point to the changing of the guard of the FOMC January mm -hmm. 31st, what happens between now and then, and how does that impact fiscal policy in 2024? So um, it, it's really a neutral shift. Mm -hmm. You've got Daly coming on. Um, you've got Bostic coming on. They're very vociferous in their bones, doves. But by the same token, uh, you've got Cleveland staying on for the first six months. Those first six months are going to be critical because the closer we get to election, mm -hmm. the less the Fed's going to do. Remember, they have a meeting that ends on November the 7th, two days after Election Day, which means September the 18th is their last opportunity really to do anything. If you look back historically, they don't like to tread in the month of October. Mm -hmm. And they're actually pushing their meeting back from November by a day. So that first six months of 2024, that's when you're going to potentially see action or not out of the FOMC, depending on what this data do. Because looking at our data right now, we have just under two rate cuts priced in by June 12th. Is that ambitious? I know you're saying basically the market is fighting the Fed, but does that kind of jive with what would be realistic, all things considered? So what I don't think is that the Bureau of Labor Statistics can continue playing this mm. game forever. They've been playing it for a long time. At some point, I think reality is going to catch up to the data and the Fed's hand will be forced. But I think that Powell would prefer that that be in May, not March. All right, I'm looking at ECFC, the economic forecast function on the Bloomberg terminal. Tells me a couple of things. Probability of recession, 50%. I guess I could have done that. Um, but I don't see it any quarter next year, negative GDP uh, in the forecast here. Are you feel comfortable with that? Or do you think there is, in fact, a So a, um, a fellow by the name of Ben Herzon, uh, he's now at S&P Global. But he eff effectively, 30 years ago, invented the GDP model that the entire street now goes off of. Okay. So he's at 0.7% for the fourth quarter yep, of this what we got. year. That's what we got. And that tells you that you are a sneeze away <laughs> from a disappointment that could actually flip that negative. 